everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, episode, I guess, of Big Ideas Live. We're going to be talking about what you can learn from a city neighborhood. Um, and I'm here tonight with Dr. Sandy Aketa from uh, SUNY Purchase College, where he's an Associate Professor of Economics at the School of Natural and Social Sciences, which is a cool sounding place. Right. Uh, so thanks All so right. much for being on tonight, Sandy. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Me too. Uh, I was telling Sandy earlier today when we were talking about going through this that this is uh, the event that one of the events that I've been really looking forward to. And the reason is that I met Sandy a couple of years ago just as I was starting to read the works of Jane Jacobs. And Sandy is also a, uh, a big fan of Jacobs. And so I was at a, uh, actually, I was at a fee seminar and somebody said, oh, make sure that you meet Sandy. Um, so he's been responsible for getting me really excited about Jane Jacobs. I'm now reading all of her work and my favorite thing that I've learned from her is the topic of this webinar, what you can learn from a city neighborhood. Uh, so I'm going to let Sandy tell us a little bit about Jane Jacobs uh, and why she's helped make him an urbanist. So tell us a little bit about um, one of your favorite people. Yeah, oh sure. Yeah, she's one of my heroes. Um, my other heroes, of course, are, are Ludwig von Mises, F.A. Hayek, um, Israel Kirzner, um, but she really fits right in there because um, when I read her um, her first book, which is The Death and Life of a Great American City, um, there was a residence. Um, it was, uh, she was talking about uh, processes, social processes, she was talking about discovery um, in ways that were uh, at the same time familiar, but also um, a little bit different because she was reaching a lot of the same conclusions about the failure of central planning, um, this time at the local level, um, but uh, using uh, insights that were very similar to that of Mises and Hayek, for example, uh, the failure of planners to take into account local knowledge. She used the term locality knowledge, but really the same thing and how difficult it is, really impossible for them to acquire that knowledge uh, to the extent that would um, uh, they would need in order to uh, plan uh, the kinds of cities that they wanted to. So she's, um, you know, arrives at a lot of uh, conclusions that were resonating with the kind of social theory that I was interested in. But um, Jacobs herself, if you want to know something about her, she's really interesting because uh, a lot of people, um, not only on the libertarian side, but also on the more leftist side, uh, are inspired by her. Um, because uh, I think she, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think, is because she um, was an activist. She mm -hmm. fought the kind of um, entrenched interest and uh, power elites in the uh, New York um, area uh, who wanted to, Robert Moses in particular, but others who wanted to sort of impose a vision um, without really on the city, without really understanding how the city works. Um, and so she, you know, got out on the street, she organized, she knew how to organize, she knew how to talk to people. Um, so that's part of it. I mean, she's sort of the, uh, part of that 1960s, late 1950s, early 1960s activism. Yeah. And she got in touch with a lot of the local activists, you know, most of whom were on the left. And she was very successful. But at the same time, um, she preached what she practiced. In other words, she was writing about what she was observing and doing. And the result of that was the life, uh, the death and life of great American cities, um, which again, uh, cast suspicion on uh, central planning, um, on uh, heavy handed in intervention. Um, I mean, she was not a, a libertarian, but she was hitting on all these you know, points that were uh, really important to people in the Austrian uh, tradition in economics and a lot of libertarians. Uh, so she appeals to both left and right. Um, she herself was not an academic. Uh, she attended, uh, she was born and raised in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, but uh, I've been through Scranton, at Pennsylvania. one point, what's that? I've been through there actually. Uh, I've I never been there. It's stop. like I should make a pilgrimage. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been to where she lived in, in the West Village, 555 Hudson Street but uh, I've never been to Scranton. So she left there after high school, she was a young woman and attend, came to New York, uh, lived with her sister. Actually, I think she lived in my neighborhood, which is Brooklyn Heights um, for a little while and attended Columbia 
university for like a semester and then sort of dropped out. She didn't like it. Uh, so she never got a, you know, uh, graduated from college. There's some suspicion that she may never have actually graduated from high school. <laughs> She's the kind of person who got bored, you know, in, in yeah. school. Uh, and then she got held various journalism jobs, particularly with Architectural Forum. Her husband, she married someone who was an architect, and so she learned a lot about design and things of that nature uh, from him. Um, and then she met uh, William H. White, uh, people like that, who are doing the sociology of cities and a lot of architects. So long story short, she kind of is an autodidact in terms of, of studying cities. Um, she once told me that she, her technique was to read everything about a subject, just immerse herself in the literature, but at the same time observe. Um, she considered herself uh, a pragmatist uh, who, uh, you know, uh, was empirical, very empirical, and um, developed her, her, her ideas in that way. Uh, so that's kind of her in a nutshell. Um, uh, she raised a family in New York when she was writing um, a Death and Life. Uh, she, she had children. Uh, she was married. She was a housewife. Also, you know, she worked. And then came the Vietnam War. And she said that uh, in order to uh, keep her sons from being drafted, among other reasons, but I think the main reason was that, they moved to Toronto. Yep. And uh, that's uh, where she spent the last part of her life. And actually, that's where I eventually got to meet her. Okay. Yeah. Um, and she's, uh, she's famous for starting, or stopping, I should say, a parkway through a, a really vibrant neighborhood in, in Toronto. So the activism did not end no. In New York. <laughs> no, in fact, well, she was very reluctant um, to, to get involved in that again. I mean, she kind of left New York in order, I mean, as I said, to, to, to save her sons from being drafted. But at the same time, you know, people were asking her to do this and that. She was a real community leader and very effective. And she just could, she couldn't write. I mean, that was her passion um, as well. And so just um, when, when I finally did get to meet her, um, it was through my, my friend and colleague, uh, Pierre Desrochers, uh, who's there in Toronto, and actually who may be listening. Hi, Pierre. Um, <laughs> and we went to her house, and it just so happened that she was between books. Because when she, she, works on, a, when she worked on a book, she, she cut everything out. You couldn't, okay. you, know, you couldn't talk to her at all. But she had just finished uh, what turned out to be her last book. And um, I think she had two more books in, under contract. She was in her 80s at the time. <laughs> Uh, but so we, we spent uh, about uh, three and a half, four hours uh, one afternoon just talking where there was just an amazing, amazing experience uh, at that time. Yeah, she was a very inspiring lady. Um, and if I'd, if I'd only known, she, she uh, only passed away, I think, in 2003 or something like that, so, fairly, fairly recently. Six, uh, so had six, I only known, I probably could have met her. Uh, it'll be one yeah, of my regrets yeah. that I didn't. Um, okay, right. so moving forward, Jacobs loved yeah. great cities, uh, and I know that you do too. You you love New York, and well, especially Brooklyn mm -hmm. Heights, your neighborhood. If uh, Sandy gives a great tour of his own neighborhood because he does Jane's walks, <laughs> which are kind of a tour right. that tell you about the history of a neighborhood. Um, and I love cities too. There's just something about all of those people working together and uh, the achievements that we can accomplish. Um, so right. what is so great about cities? Why should everybody love cities? Um, well, I mean, you can appreciate cities on different levels. I think people just, you know, like the experience of being in a city. That, that's, um, you know, I, I've come to appreciate cities in that way. I guess um, I've always wanted to live in a big city. I grew up in a small town in the West, in the Southwest, and, uh, you know, finally just, you know, by luck ended up here. Um, but you know, my, when I really got passionate about cities uh, was sort of uh, intellectually. When I, really, when I read Jacobs, I, I started to understand why I like them in a way. Yeah. Uh, just at a, you know, at a kind of a, a, a visual level, just what an experiential level. But it, because, like I said earlier, when I read her, she really resonated with this other stuff that I was doing. Uh, at the time, I was working on uh, the dynamics of interventionism. And it's something I still keep in touch with. Um, and then um, I think it was Pete Betke who recommended that I do something on urban interventionism. And, and Pierre also suggested that I read Jacobs. Um, 
to do this. Uh, so when I when I did it, just it was when I read the book. I think you had the same experience. You read uh, Death and Life, Great American Cities, and it's just it's a really an eye opener. It's one of those books that uh, uh, makes you see things in a completely different way. I mean, you take things for granted, and you like a city sidewalk or some some um, urban design, some design of public space, and it just you know oh so that's why it's this way. That's why yeah. you start to she gave. Um, she gave me a, a vocabulary and a sort of a framework to to understand how things are working. So, um, so that was sort of the beginning of it. But from that came an interest in um, social networks, in the uh, concept of trust and how that's important, in the um, history of the first cities, going back to like Jericho. Uh, uh, Chateau Huyuk um, and others, uh, the Natufians, um, who were the first uh, settlers, who had the first settlements in the Middle East, and uh, and all of that. Just it's uh, it's kind of she really opened a lot of doors um, for me, and just intellectually, it's just been a lot of fun. Um, and I'm still interested in interventionism. I'm still interested in economics, obviously. Um, I still consider myself an, an economist. However, when people ask me, you know, what kind of economics I do, I, I think I've got an answer down, but I, I have to pause because I realize it's not a, it's, I'm not an urban economist. That's a okay. certain thing. Um, in fact, you know, you know, the truth in advertising here, I've never taken a course in urban <laughs> economics. And I really never have taught a course strictly speaking in urban economics, okay. although my courses on my course in cities, culture and economy at purchase, you know, I draw on urban economics. Um, I, you know, I, what I do, I guess, is sort of urban, sorry, is um, uh, economic sociology. I look at, at, yep. at cities as, an, um, as a, uh, a dynamic uh, generator of economic development. I guess that's one thing I have to add to what I was saying before, but why I'm interested. Um, I'm a big, uh, uh, fan of Israel Kersner and uh, the idea of entrepreneurship. And what Jacobs did was help me to see what the mechanisms of entrepreneurship are. And not only that, to see cities as places where people who are, under, who are interested in market processes really need to study. Um, cities are embody a lot of the things that economists, uh, whether you're Austrian or whatever, are interested in. Like, Markets, uh, prices, money, uh, property rights, um, uh, public goods, externalities, uh, these things are all urban phenomena. And so if you, if you really want to understand how those work, you have to understand cities. And again, this is sort of um, on top of the social network theory stuff that, that I think, bring, for me, brings everything together, kind of makes it all co cohere. Yeah. Um... If you're if you're somebody who cares about I think uh, the way that people cooperate in uh, human freedom and flourishing, there's a really rich history in cities. Um, my my family background is German, and uh, Tom Palmer told a story at a, a seminar I went to a long time ago, and uh, about the German Borgs where they used to put on the the sign or the uh, plaque over the door to the city. Uh, Stadluft macht frei, which is city air makes one free, and it used right. to be that if you could, if you could, if you were a serf, and right. you could make it into the city for a year and a day, you would become right. part of the community, and they would protect your freedom. It's just kind of that that cool sense of community, um, and history, and I, I, yeah, it's it's really, I don't know. There's something about it. You know what I mean? It's really yeah, I mean, they, once you get it. I think the origins of that is it's not because people, you know, the the the, the burgermeisters or whatever were nice guys. But they realized it was these people who were being attracted to cities were really uh, useful. I mean, these are people who are industrious, who want, who had ideas, who were seeking opportunity, um, and you know they didn't have much wealth. But these are, are, are what uh, are responsible for the economic development. And I think that this idea that that you know you have a city that welcomes strangers. I mean, it's a nice. It's one of those things. It's yeah. It's a nice thing. But it has a very practical uh, side to it, right? They wanted they wanted people to be able to stay. You know, they want they had to mollify the, you know, the uh, the lords of the manors who were after me, who might be concerned about their, their, their yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Oh, no, I was I mean, going to say, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, trust in a little bit too, because yes, uh, I yeah. think it's an important topic. And just one, one last thing. Yeah, a lot of, of the uh, people who move to, to the cities, I think this is, I mean, this is particularly true with the rebirth of cities after the Middle Ages, uh, but I think this is, this is sort of true in general, uh, that the growth of cities in the most dynamic part of cities tended to be on the outskirts, what we today call the, the, the suburbs, right? the mm -hmm. faubourg, the, the places where, strictly speaking, we're outside the control of the, of the, of the crafts, uh, guilds, and you know, the, the, the burgermeisters and everything. So people would settle kind of out, just outside that district where they could do their own thing. Uh, and so you know, we think of the suburbs today as being um, kind of the anti-city. Uh, and you know we'll talk about that later. It's, when they're when they're artificially accelerated, their growth is it can be, but historically, you know, the dynamism of cities have, have really come about as a result of development on the that the, the penumbra of cities, the, 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 out, the outskirts. Um, okay, uh, so very briefly, because I want to give everybody a chance for questions. Uh, a lot of people have a bad opinion of cities. Uh, why do you, why do you think that is? I'm sorry, a lot of people have what? A bad opinion of cities. They don't like oh. cities. They feel like oh, they're not I mean, you know, cities. I guess there are different reasons people may have had a bad experience. My father, for example, just hated big cities, uh, and he grew up on, on a farm and, and all of that. So uh, there, there are people who, who um, don't like big crowds and things like that. Yeah. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, but I think cities have gotten a bad reputation. Uh, people associated with crime, for example, mm -hmm. you know, the dangerous city. Uh, they associate it with pollution, uh, for example, congestion, and um, and all of that. Now, crime aside, uh, cities are uh, places where uh, you know there is congestion. Um, mm -hmm. uh, also, cities are places where you see weird things. Um, <laughs> you know, people um, aren't accustomed to you know. People cross-dressing, or you know, loud noises uh, on the street, or people suddenly approaching you, um, and the kinds of you know, sex shops and kinds of uh, <laughs> things that you you typically you things see you in big cities. Things you don't see in a small town. Go to. What's that? The things that you don't see so often in a small town. Yeah, well, yeah, that's kind of hidden away in a small town. The cities are kind of mm -hmm. out in the open, and there's a lot of it and stuff that you can't even. Have imagined existed, and so that that strangeness is very scary to a lot of people, um, and uh, you know it's there. Uh, it is smelly. It is uh, noisy, uh, congested. Uh, you know that's so. I think that's that kind of that side of the city is something that um, one reason why it gets a bad rep. Now the crime thing is 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 another thing, um, and that you know high crime is, is an indicator of a, of a failure of the city which is something that we're going to get to. Uh, but I want to pause to give everybody a chance uh, to ask questions. And I'm going to launch one of our polls. If you haven't uh, done an event with us before, I will occasionally pop up one of these. So just let me know how you think. There's no right answer or wrong answer. Um, we'll kind of discuss it a little bit. And if you have any questions, you can type them at any time, but I'll encourage you to type them now. Um, we have been throwing around a little bit of economic jargon, which is okay, but if you didn't know some of it, uh, for instance, externalities, uh, mm. ask about it and we will do our best uh, to explain it before going forward because we don't want you to feel lost. Um, but I'm not, I haven't got anything about that, so if I don't, I'm going to assume that everything's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing, you know, people don't like getting lost. <laughs> yeah, and often in cities, that's what happens to you. You get lost, and it's kind of well, scary. They're definitely much bigger. Okay, so I don't have any questions yet, and I, oh, yeah. I've got a bunch of people. Almost everybody has voted, so I'm, I'm going to close the poll. Um, but I will let you know that 59% of people who responded love cities, and 41% can take them or leave them. Nobody uh -huh. hates cities. Who's on here today? Which is maybe a little bit unsurprising. Um, well, there's there a selection bias. A little thing bit of a biased on. sample here. Right. <laughs> oh, actually, I do have one quick question. Somebody said, what about the high cost of living in cities? The high cost of living? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that can be a problem, you know. Um, for cities to be 
uh, incubators of ideas and, and sort of engines of economic development. Uh, there have to be opportunities for people without a lot of money but with um, good ideas to, uh, to live um, in or near cities. And so, um, yeah, the high cost of living, high price of real estate um, is, is, is a problem. Now, um, in most cities, there are districts that are not uh, high price. These are places that may not have good transportation. They may have a bad reputation. Uh, they may, in fact, be dangerous, um, or they may feel insecure. And that's where typically uh, people tend to move uh, who don't have much money. Um, you know, the, you know, the Docklands and, and London, which are now you know, fabulously expensive, uh, were not so much like 20 years ago, 25 years mm -hmm. ago. Here in New York, uh, Williamsburg, right? Uh, I remember when I was a graduate student uh, many, many years ago looking for a place to live, I, I checked out Williamsburg and, and there was a, uh, and still is a very large Hasidic uh, Jewish community there and, and not much else. Uh, and now, as, uh, as you know, it's like the center of hipsterdom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so things like that happen. Um, so, I mean, and New York is kind of a, a weird case because it really is difficult in the city to find affordable housing that's not, you know, subsidized by the government. Uh, strangely enough, you can find um, housing that's subsidized privately um, uh, for, you know, uh, development. Um, but mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit rare. Uh, there are places in the outskirts, uh, Brownsville, um, in, in, in Brooklyn and elsewhere, in Queens and, and in um, the, you know, the Bronx, that, that are still relatively affordable. But yeah, now that is. Now, the thing is, cities are not monolithic. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make that, the, that there's some neighborhoods and districts that are economically vibrant, and therefore uh, you see the real estate prices rising in other places that aren't. Um, and so over time, you see this, this kind of shift from one. Um, to another, the prices rising and falling and then falling and then rising elsewhere. Okay, um, so I have a couple of questions, but knowing where the conversation's going, um, I think that uh -huh. we might handle them a little bit later. Uh, so if everybody will bear with me, I am not forgetting about you. I just, am, we're gonna move forward and I will uh, ask your questions in a little bit. Um, so before we go any further, I just wanted to quickly talk about a, um, a subject that I think is kind of the root of um, the insights that you can gain from a city. And that's a topic called spontaneous order is the sort of jargony name for it. Emergent order is another uh, term that people like. And the technical definition is it's an order that comes about as a result of human action, but not as a result of human design. So a bunch of people um, are all going about their own business and a sort of order emerges. And for me, when I read Death and Life of Great American Cities, I had, it was just this amazing, she didn't, uh, Jacobs didn't know what spontaneous order was. Um, she didn't use that word. No, and I, I don't think, she, well, maybe she had heard it, but she, she, did, she wasn't using that jargon, um, but that's what she was describing in the way that her neighborhood works. Um, right. So do you have anything that you want to say about spontaneous order that might be uh, useful to the people listening before we go forward? And then that, we're going to jump right into talking about what makes a good city neighborhood work. Um, yeah, it, it, it's an important concept. I think it holds the key to understanding a lot of, you know, about society, about the social order. Um, but I think what some people find confusing about it is um, that at some level, there's always some conscious planning. It's not spontaneous mm -hmm. uh, at some level of, of some social order. You know, if you, take a, uh, if you take a city, for example, people always say, well, you know, it's, it's, it is a man-made creation because it, uh, you know, these buildings were, were designed by an architect and they were constructed according to fairly meticulous plans and, you know, it was uh, very well thought out. And, and so that's, that's certainly true. Uh, moreover, they'll point out that, well, there are highways, there are roads, you know, who will build the roads? Um, there's infrastructure there that um, is uh, definitely the result of somebody's overarching plan. That, that's undeniable. The question is whether uh, you can have a city, a vibrant city, without that kind of central planning from, you know, top down. 
Um, you know, that's one issue. I think uh, more um, germane would be to ask, you know, given, given we have some central planning, we have a, a, a government that governs these things, uh, to what extent uh, is that a help or a hindrance? I guess we'll talk about that in more detail later. But let me just say that even where the government, the local government plans an infrastructural thing, like uh, subways, for example, that over time is also a spontaneous order. Um, for example, when, when the first subways in New York were established in 1904, um, I don't think anyone could have foreseen exactly how it would have uh, not only developed, but how it would have affected the city. Um, I wrote about this in a column not too long ago, how um, the subways were an attempt to create urban sprawl. That is to say, the the Lower East Side and places like that where there were working working people um, mm -hmm. tended to be very overcrowded. And one of the justifications for the subway at the time was to allow people to live outside the city and commute to the city. Right? So they wanted to subsidize suburbanization or at least go out to the outer boroughs, Brooklyn, you know, outer boroughs of Brooklyn, Queens, etc. And so the subways would go out to where people weren't. And it was it was kind of like the interstate highway system, you know, on a small scale. You're, you're deliberately trying to um, to lower the density of the cities. And um, what happened was then that the city built up around the transport hubs, right? built up around where the subways um, stopped. And the city infilled uh, to the point now where, you know, it's the subway runs in, in some of the densest places uh, on earth, yeah. uh, or at least in the United States. Um, so, I mean, nobody predicted that would, well, no, Somebody might have predicted it, but I don't think the planners were intending for that to happen when it was initially designed. So that's an example of a pattern that is a result of human action, but was not, uh, it's a stable pattern that, that nobody uh, had intended to create. Yeah, and uh, we have, I have a lot of resources on spontaneous order that I'll make available to everybody afterwards. So if you're hearing this and thinking, oh, that's interesting, but I don't quite get it, or um, you think this sounds great and you want to learn more, I'm going to try and make a lot of uh, a lot of resources available to you. Um, so what can we learn from a city neighborhood? Uh, this is the question um, that I've been so excited to ask. Uh, so first let's talk about cities at their best. Uh, when you're walking around a neighborhood and it's uh, a, you know, the kind of neighborhood you want to rock, walk around, it's vibrant, it's safe, there's a lot of stuff going on. People are, are generally pretty friendly, um, although People have different definitions of what that means. Like you said, some people don't. <laughs> Not like being people. attacked could be friendly. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, so, what can we what can we learn when we look around a neighborhood like that? Well, you know, the the main indicator is are there people around, right? That's the first thing. If there aren't, that's the first thing you notice, right? If you go out onto the street, say, you know, you you land in, a, in an airport, you get in a taxi, you go to your hotel, um, and then you know you get unpacked and you go outside the door. And you look around, there's nobody. Right? This, yeah. you're, you're, you're surrounded by tall buildings and you know, uh, parking garages uh, and, and, and things of that nature. And you walk, where the heck is everybody? That's, yeah. you, you notice that when a city or a neighborhood is not functioning, that there's, there just aren't many people. On the other hand, you know, if you leave your hotel and the people walking on the sidewalk, it's something you don't notice. Um, you kind of take That's for true. granted. And you walk, okay, this, you just sort of feel, oh, well, the other people, and you kind of move around with the travel, you know, with, the, with the foot traffic. Uh, obviously, there's vehicular traffic too, but it's mainly the foot traffic that would attract you. And you think, okay, well, let's, let's, let's see if I can find a restaurant okay, nearby and, you know, where there are people on the street. Typically, there are restaurants that you can find that, that aren't too far away. Um, so, you know, that's, that's probably the main indicator is, you know, whenever it is you go out, of the hotel, whether it's in the morning or afternoon or after dark, uh, there are people there. Um, so that gives you a sense of security and comfort that mm -hmm. then uh, frees you to, to explore and to, to find um, kinds of uh, uh, alternatives or, or find things that you, you know, uh, might not have expected. Yeah. Um, for And this is, I don't know if it's silly. I, I definitely noticed since reading Jacob, she calls them eyes on the street. And they're kind of like an unofficial security source. 
Um, the fact that you right. know that there are people around who are seeing what's happening right. uh, is, yeah. is mean, a way that we lifting, make each other safer. Yeah, I was just saying the, the heavy lifting of, of, of security. See, the thing is, um, the main thing is you have to feel secure. Yes. Uh, clearly, there has to be security, but if there's security and you don't feel secure, then it's no good. You have to sort of feel comfortable. Um, and one of the things that does that is, is seeing other people uh, and, and, you know, they could be ignoring you. They don't have to be friendly or approach you or anything like that. But just the idea that, that somebody is watching, um, you know, not, not, <laughs> not the creepy kind of watching where there's this sort of staring at you. But, you know, if you were to fall or somebody bumped into you or you lose something, somebody would actually see that. That is, so uh, I think, what Jacobs means by eyes, by eyes on the street. You, uh, the heavy lifting of security is done just by having people on the street. Um, you know, in, on the margins, you need to have uh, some sort of enforcement of, of, of the local rules or things like that. Uh, but uh, as she said, if in, if in or uh, Jacob said, if in order to, to maintain a sense of security, you have to have a, a, a policeman in every corner, that's, a, that's an indication of failure. Yeah, and I don't think it feels safe when you have no, a policeman. It, no, no, not at all. It seems like, like something's wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if there's a uniform person there, whether it's uh, police or military, we're seeing more and more military people and you mm. know, fatigues and things. Um, uh, it, it, you know, it's like, you know, on one hand you think, okay, maybe uh, I feel secure, this guy's got a gun, I think he's on my side, whatever, but I mean, it's, it's a little strange. It's not you know, what you're used to seeing in, yeah. a, in, a, in a comfortable environment. Yeah, and I, I mean, that's what's really interesting to me is it's, you kind of, you said you don't notice when there are people on the street, and it's a lot of stuff that you don't notice, I think is yeah. what may, or at least unless you know to look for it, you right. don't notice things. Uh, one story that I like to tell is I, I used to jog down, I live in Ottawa in Canada, and I used to jog down the canal. There's a big canal that goes right down the middle of, uh, Ottawa in the winter, it's the world's largest outdoor skating rink. Uh, it's a fun fact that you all now know about Ottawa. Um, and you go through very different neighborhoods. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the things that you notice are kind of when there's only one sort of thing, when there's just homes, there's not really very many people out. They might be out in the evenings or they might be out in the mornings, but during the day and at night, nobody's outside. Um, if the sidewalks are very straight and there's not stuff going on, there aren't too many people out. But if there's a kind of you know, just little things like just the sidewalk curves, there's more likely to be people. And then especially when you get into the city and there are different, you know, there's a restaurant and a shopping and a bar. And uh, especially in the summer, there are houseboats parked along the canal as well. So you've mm -hmm. got people really out at all times of day. Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff that I never knew to look for. And I think it's right. it's cool. And I really like the way that you said it, that you, you probably don't notice it. And yeah, if it works right. well, you probably don't notice it unless you know to look. And it's such a cool story when you know to look for it. So at, at the time Jacobs wrote her Death and Life of Great American Cities, um, her target was a certain kind of urban planning, uh, which emphasized separating uses, mm -hmm. um, sort of zoning in a very strict sense. You had residential, you had commercial, you had like, manufacturing, et cetera. And these things had to be kept se uh, separate. Why? Well, because it was some person's idea that these had to be separate. Somebody's notion of order that they were trying to impose on a city. And what Jacob's basic argument was, that's not the order that's important in the city. Right? The, the order that's important is the one that emerges as a result of people having contact. And if you look closely enough, you can see these patterns. And her argument was that the very things that you try to do to maintain this artificial order, uh, destroy the emergent order. She didn't use that term, but she, this, right. this order that, that comes about as a result of um, the unintended consequence, that is really the life of the city, right? She says, wh wh when you think of a city, typically, you know, your impression is gained at the street level, what, what you see going on at that, at that level. And that's a spontaneous order. She says that, you know, there's a, the, the book is about the interaction between the design of public space, streets, sidewalks, plazas, that sort of thing, where pu public spaces I define as places where you would expect to, to see strangers, right? Where seeing a stranger is not, yeah. is not a weird thing. So the design of those spaces and the social interaction that goes on in them, um, and that was a, a big point in her book. And she was saying that the way that planners of her era 
imagined a city should be uh, were at odds with that kind of order that emerges spontaneously. But if you read, you know, more deeply into that, I think what she was opposed to was the idea that architects or planners could impose any kind of order, right? Yeah, and it's the imposition of a particular vision that's the problem because cities are much more complex than an individual mind. Cities are a result of many minds uh, operating, right? Um, and so, um, when you try to impose a, a, a particular plan, even if it's in some genius's plan, it's just a single mind. It's like a market, right? Market functions because there are a lot of people who are operating in it and, and, and are able to use their, not only their intelligence, but their local knowledge. Um, and yeah. so, I mean, that's something she, she definitely emphasized. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, the, this emergent order that we're talking about earlier is, is really a, a, a central theme in, in that yeah. book and really in all her work. Yeah. Can I just say one um, thing? Oh yeah, of course. One thing, just, um, you know, the, I, I asked her once what she thought her main contribution was and she answered immediately, the fractal. <laughs> okay. And what she, meant, what she meant by that, I, I think, is that things scale up. Yeah. That, uh, the principles that operate at the level of the neighborhood, operate at the level of the district, operate at the level of cities, at the level of regions, and then the relationships be between cities. The same kind of complexity that she was um, um, writing about and analyzing at the neighborhood level that generate diversity of, of land use, that, that encourage diversity of knowledge and skills and tastes, those things scale up. Um, you know, when you, the idea of a fractal is, you know, you see the earth, you see the coastline, you, you zoom in, you see the coastline and it's all sort of jagged and you look at the beach, and you come zoom in at the beach, you know, at, at the you know, microscopic level, it's all jagged and you zoom in again. So this, the same kind of principle of some sort of patterns emerge. And so she was sort of, she thought she'd done that, um, discovered something at the social level, that these things do scale up. Yeah, I, yeah, that's cool. I, I would never have thought of putting it that way. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. Um, we were going to talk specifically about trust, but I hope that we've sort of covered that. Um, we can come back to it if we have time, but I have a lot of really great questions, so I want to give people okay. a chance to ask sure. them. Um, so, uh, well, one, one that kind of, you've talked a little bit about zoning now, and we were talking about housing prices before. Um, Tate asks, what of, how much do zoning laws affect housing prices? How much do you think that factors into the expensiveness of cities? Um, zoning, uh, yeah, that's a very complex issue. Um, zoning tends to exclude, right? Um, and sometimes that's their function. Other times zoning is not enforced. And so it's a way of handing out political favors at the local level. I know this because I have some, not direct personal experience, but I know that this sort of thing goes on, that you, you petition the zoning board for exceptions and things of that nature. But if you can think of zoning, you know, as it's supposed to be, uh, as it's supposed to be practiced, it's, it's um, usually, as I said, it sort of excludes uh, uh, people or uses that you don't like, okay? so. Uh, let me give an example of my own neighborhood here, uh, Brooklyn Heights. It's it's actually beyond zoning. It's it's a landmarked district. That means that uh, if you want to change anything on the exterior of your building, for example, let alone if you want to build a new building, it has to get mm -hmm. permission from the Landmarks Preservation Commission here in New York. Um, and the result of that is that this is a very pretty neighborhood. Uh, most of the buildings were built uh, pre-Civil War. Oh, sorry, I should say a lot of them. Um, townhouses uh, built pre-Civil War. Uh, it's um, you know, a charming, charming. You, you've been here, right? It's a, yeah, it's I, I can neighbor. recommend Brooklyn Heights to anybody <laughs> who wants a cool place to go in New York. Yeah, so it's it's a little bit like I guess um, uh, you know um, the uh, uh, it's like a museum um, in a way, a museum with restaurants. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's, so it's nice for people who, who, who live here, uh, but the prices, as the questioner is indicating, tend to really, really go up. Uh, on the other hand, you have places that are zoned industrial, mm -hmm. and uh, those you know, tend to be 
uh, you know, there are exceptions to this, of course, but those tend to be uh, low value real estate. Um, and not only that, but the places that are around them because of the sort of what J Jacobs would call a border vacuum because the, the, you have a massive single use in these industrial districts. So that there are a lot of people there, let's say from nine to five, but after that there's nobody. Uh, they tend to be kind of dead zones, not only inside, but, but surrounding them. And that tends to bring down um, uh, real estate values and, and just you know, economic activity in general. That concept of border vacuums, I think, is very important to understanding a, a yeah. lot of what goes on. Uh, well, so, so yeah, it can go both ways. It really depends on how, um, how the zoning is done. Yeah. Uh, I've got one more question, and while I ask it, I'm going to run my second poll. Uh, so I'm going to launch it. It will disappear okay. for a second for everybody. Um, but the second question that I've got, it's an interesting one from Thomas. It says, I'm watching this webinar with my five-year-old son who recently informed me that what he wants to be when he grows up is a guy who decides where skate parks are, I'm sorry, skate parks are built. <laughs> with that in mind, yeah, it's cool. Donald Trump. <laughs> with that in mind, what insights can you give with regard to cities that master their community recreational spaces and those that allow community members to de develop them on their own, such as the Burnside Skate Park in Portland, which I'm not familiar with, but it sounds. I'm cool. not familiar with that either, uh, but um, I guess you know Jacob said things to say about about parks and, and things of that nature. Um, she called. She described parks as volatile, as volatile places. Um, and she said that parks, as a rule, draw their life from cities, and that, that, and that parks do not give life to cities. Um, you know, parks by nature are um, empty spaces, or that is to say, where there's no commercial or residential use there. Uh, and that means that uh, if you plop this empty space in an area that is already kind of troubled, where people don't go, uh, or that's just sort of on the edge, you know, thinking maybe, well, what these people who live here really need is uh, open space in a park, uh, which is something that uh, Robert Moses did a lot of, um, and Jacobs complained about, um, is it can really uh, bring a neighborhood down um, because these places can be very scary. That is to say, you know, what we were saying earlier about, about people, eyes on the street, people attracting people. If there's no reason for people to be in the park, um, then people aren't going to go there unless they don't want to be seen. Um, and, you know, such people tend to be, you know, criminals or you know, gangs or things or people like that. Um, and so they can, that's that's the volatility of, of parks. They, they um, now, if you put a park where there's already, uh, you know, residential, commercial, um, uh, you know, a diversity of, of uses of, of space, then they could be successful. And, you know, she, she gave an example. Um, you know, if you take a, a say, say a park is put in a residential area, put a skating rink in a residential area where there is no commercial development, uh, say, then you know, there's no restaurants, there's no, no McDonald's or anything like that. Then what happens when you have to go to the bathroom? Right. right. Maybe you know somebody next door, you knock on the door and say, excuse me, can I use the bathroom? That's a very difficult thing to do. And you'd never do it unless you know, to a stranger, unless it's like yeah. an emergency or something. So, you know, your, your stay would be short term and it would discourage you from going. Whereas, or if you get thirsty and you, know, you want a drink or something, you go and you have, you have to walk several blocks to get to a place to get a drink or a hamburger or something. If, if the park is, is surrounded by not only residential, but also some commercial place you can get a, get a bite to eat and maybe use the bathroom, then people will hang around the park. They will, people will stay there. They'll, so this diversity of land use was very important to her um, as a principle of attracting uh, people to those spaces, make them feel comfortable, and in turn, laying the foundation for economic development. So, yeah, I, I think skating rinks are great. I don't skate myself. Well, actually, I, I fall uh, when I try <laughs> to skate. But uh, uh, you have to be very careful, okay, uh, five-year-old, that uh, you uh, put those uh, skating rinks uh, where they're going to be used and where people who use them 
um, are able to feel comfortable and, and yeah. have good, good bathrooms. So I'm not sure, but he also may have been talking about skateboarding. And if he was, then I have uh, I have kind of a story. My old neighborhood, I used to live in Windsor, which is right across the, the river from Detroit, Michigan. Um, but I was in Canada. And there was a park where kids were skateboarding. They would all get together and they would skateboard. And so they put us. They put one of these. I don't know what it's called, but you can uh, you can skate yeah. back and forth on it. Yeah. And everybody was there all the time. It was right in the neighborhood where people already were. And now I live in Ottawa. And uh, in Ottawa, there's a skate park, and it's kind of. They've obviously tried to take the kids on the skateboards out of the neighborhood and put them somewhere else. And I only ever see kids huh. skateboarding there on the weekend. Um, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like you can just go out and skateboard really quickly. Uh, you you have to make a special trip. So right. I think that there's a role for taking cues, like uh, looking for hints in the neighborhood for what people yeah. want already. Right, um, right. So if you if you do become somebody who decides where skate parks go, uh, maybe try to keep those things in mind. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is, you know, if you're going to build a skating rink or a skateboard place, you know, in a purely residential area, then you have to supply like a snack bar. You have to supply bathrooms. So these are yeah. additional expenses, which may discourage you from doing it in the first place. Um, I don't know if you've been to London, um, the South Bank of London, near I guess it's near the National Theatre. Anyway, there's this okay. there's this um, uh, place that's uh, underneath a, a, an overhang, and there's like a there's a, a cement bench that was you know put there by the architect, and it's kind of out of the public. And what happens is it's it's you know, 24 seven, there are guys on skateboards going up and down this ramp. It's probably, I don't know what, what the, it's, it's not that big. Uh, and the police sort of let that happen. Um, I saw the, uh, the, um, um, uh, policeman, um, reprimanding one, um, uh, uh, skateboarder for, uh, I don't know, playing music or something. He says, you know, you're not supposed to do the skate, but don't do that. So there's, there are these rules, these sort of unwritten rules that they can do. And it's right there, and and it's it's really you know it, people who go to London they know this, but it's 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 you can see some really yeah. fantastic skateboarding there, and why? Well, because there's like a, a, a cafe in yeah. nearby. Um, it's just a lot of people. It's a nice setting. Anyway. Yeah, I, sh I should say in Windsor, this the skateboarding park was across from the All You Can Eat Diner, or not All You Can Eat, but Breakfast All the Time yeah. Diner. Um, so there, there were some things nearby. Um, I'm gonna I, mean, I mean, there are these complementarities that exist in yeah. cities that were unplanned, right? This is the spontaneous yeah. nature of cities again. That you get this complementarity that that uh, uh, is, you know, uh, promotes um, comfort and eventually, hopefully, economic development. Um, I'm going to fold a couple of good questions in. Uh, I want to talk about uh, poorly functioning neighborhoods and a couple of questions might help uh, with that. So somebody asked about the extreme poverty and, and crime in projects with poor schools and poor children or for poor children and larger and larger cities don't seem to care about them. Um, is this inevitable in great cities? Um, and the other question is, uh, what is your view on the self-destruction of diversity, which is a little bit of Jacob's jargon. Um, she kind of says that cities that are doing well are destined to become too expensive to be diverse um, or have other things go wrong. Um, and they can lead to neighborhoods that used to be good, uh, but no longer function well. So let's talk a little bit about neighborhoods that don't function uh, terribly well. And then I've got a tough question for you and you're, we're going to wrap up. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, poor people are attracted to cities. Right? You go to uh, any great city today or throughout history, there'd be a lot of poor people, which is, you know, um, Ed Glazer, who published a book in 2012 called, called The Triumph of the City, says that uh, this, that is actually a sign of success in the city, where you see poor people. Because that means, well, of a certain kind, that there, there are poor people without much money, immigrants maybe from outside the city, they could be from foreign countries too, who see opportunity in cities, and so they, they move there um, hoping to, to do better. Uh, Jacobs distinguishes between um, slumming and unslumming neighborhoods. 
That is, he says, not all slums are the same. Slums are basically where poor people live. Okay, they live in one place because the rents are cheap. But there are neighborhoods that are slums that are vibrant and that are on the way up, and then there are neighborhoods that are slums that, that are dying. And there are certain indicators you should, there's, you know, she has a fairly specific indicators of which, you know, when you tell one from the other. But that's an important distinction to, 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 to make between not all, not all slums are the same. Um, now, why are some slums uh, persistent? Uh, by, by the way, you know, Harlem in its heyday was a slum, and it was one of the most creative uh, places uh, on earth uh, for a long time. Uh, maybe not so much anymore, but it's actually on its way back up. Um, so, you know, what happens is, you, you know, there's a com combination of, oh, all kinds of government interventions that contribute to this um, redistribution, uh, which, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not making any broad statement against redistribution or the welfare state right. and that thing here, but. A topic for another not, day. Yeah, no, I mean, let's not, you know, fool ourselves that this has not had a disincentive effect um, or an incentive effect uh, on um, people not being able to, to uh, emerge from the slum. Uh, all kinds of public policies, uh, public schools, as opposed to private schools, um, you know, exacerbate the problem. I mean, if you look back in the history of cities, as I say, there have always been poor people, there have always been slums, but the sort of um, great society welfare programs, uh, subsidized housing, uh, other kinds of interventions with respect to wages and that kind of thing didn't exist. And, you know, uh, maybe that would have helped in some cases, but, you know, the New York, uh, Rose to be a great city without those things. Uh, New York, yeah. probably its heyday, uh, maybe its golden age, was um, 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, okay. You know, in terms of creativity, economic dynamism, it also reached the, the zenith of its population at that time. Uh, it's approaching that again. But anyway, I mean, this is before the Great Society programs. This is before massive ho housing projects. So that's something to consider. Okay. Um, so yeah, and oh, and, sorry, you want me to say a little bit about self destruction? Uh, yeah. If you if you've got uh, a self a little bit, just very briefly. I, I know we're short sure of time, but the idea behind that is that a neighborhood becomes so successful that real estate values, for example, are skyrocketing. That only large firms and very rich people can live there. Um, something like uh, New York Soho. Uh, is, is, yeah. uh, is a good example of that, which was light industrial in the 1950s, then it kind of declined. Okay. Artists moved in, and it, now it's, it's like Madison Avenue. Uh, and Jacobs's complaint about that was that, um, or not complaint, or her observation was that because only the wealthy, both businesses and residents, can 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 live there or or, or operate there, um, the kind of experimentation kind of diversity that is necessary uh, for uh, these pools of resources that are necessary for innovation and dynamic growth uh, disappear. And so she says, well, they will leave, they will go someplace else. They might go to Dumbo or they might go to, she didn't men mention these names, but to, to Williamsburg or to some other place, Silicon Alley. Uh, and so it's sort of a cycle that, that happens. And I mean, this is where she said there may be a role for, for um, government policy. That uh, you know is mainly kind of government staying out of the way that you uh, allow neighborhoods where there are um, possibilities for people to move in that haven't done so that that haven't uh, become vibrant yet. At least don't do you know don't build massive projects there. Don't uh, create wide streets that would block the flow of traffic and yeah. cut off so the, the the social networking that's necessary. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe if you're going to plan something, plan for there to be more um, intricate streets and things of that nature there where people could run into each other. And this is more complicated than that, but yeah. she, she had some role for government planning to help foster this kind of um, natural cycl cyclical development that uh, occurs in cities. Yeah. Um, so she, she had, had a tough very, question very complicated ideas of how to deal with this. Uh, I really recommend Death and Life of Great American Cities to anybody who's interested in this stuff. It's a really great book. Um, so I, Can I the just reason one more that, one before uh, you answer, Tess, 
before you ask, ask your tough question, just one thing. In the last <laughs> chapter of that book, she, she says, what kind of problem is the city? She yeah. doesn't use the, the term spontaneous order, but that's, that's, that's the chapter where she deals with, you know, looking back and asks, you know, what is the nature of this thing we're looking at? And she calls the, a city a problem of, com, of, a problem of complexity. Yeah. Right? City that, is, that was my is favorite complex. chapter. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't judge anyone who reads that chapter second, maybe. <laughs> maybe not <laughs> it's first, because the first chapter. It's, it's a very Hayekian kind of chapter. Yeah. She, again, she doesn't use the term spontaneous order, but, but that's what she's really talking about. In that in that chapter, what is the nature of the city? Well, it's a problem of organized organized complexity. It's yeah, a it's a very human problem because we react when people try to do things to us. Other unlike uh, a lot of nature or um, you know inanimate objects. Um, so as Sandy knows, I have a tough question for him. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up across the river from Detroit, and if you've never been to Detroit, it's an interesting place to go, um, and it's an interesting place to read the history of because Detroit was a really great city. Um, and now there are there are literally skyscrapers that are empty. Um, the Michigan Central Skit Station is this really amazing um, train station, and it's got a, a office towers on top of it, and you can see through it because it's empty and the windows are broken. And that actually, part of Transformers Three was filmed there. This is how bad it was. It looked like whatever city they're in. I I, I don't think it's supposed to be Detroit in that movie, but it looks like it's been attacked by Decepticons, basically. Um, so this is like a real failure of a city. Like it's really, really sad. Um, so what do you think can be done to help um, a, a failed city? Detroit might be, we were talking about this, Detroit might be the only example of a whole city that's failed, but also neighborhoods that are having a really hard time. Do you think there's anything that pe can be done in terms of policy that we can uh, pursue? Um, we can make it easier to start a business there. Yep. Um, we can do things at least in the short run that would Increase safety, which may involve police, but it could be something else as simple as, you know, adding, uh, you know, allowing businesses to come and so that there are more people on the street. I mean, again, I, I haven't studied it very closely. Yeah. I, I know in general what the problems are. Uh, but, you know, in, so there, you know, given the situation now, um, there are limited things one can do. Uh, um, what you don't want, but what you can do, do is sort of learn from Detroit. Um, okay. Because, as you say, there was a time when Detroit was was very vibrant. It was you know one of the great cities in, in the United States, you know, fueled by the automobile industry. Mm -hmm. And it's a very complicated, as all you know, urban problems are. It's a very complicated problem because um, Jacobs and others might point to the fact that it was a, a sort of a monoculture, a monoculture, a single industry dominating everything, and um, and all of that. Others would point to perhaps quite rightly, that back in the 70s when Chrysler and other um, uh, these large corporations were beginning to fail, the government bailed them out. Well, maybe they should have failed then. And by this time, 40 years later, right, it's been 40 years, something else would have emerged and taken its place. But instead, we, we propped up the uh, corporations, we propped up the UAW, uh, which in some cases, you know, it's really the same thing. Um, and all of that, you, you, we've sustained this monoculture uh, in Detroit, way beyond what it, you know, probably should have been its life expectancy, mm -hmm. uh, and they've been trying to do things like, you know, create a, a people mover, right, <laughs> a mass transit yeah, that, that's uh, kind the, of thing. The Detroit that they monorail think is, for anyone who doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. Detroit that's has a monorail. Like, There's like nobody on it. It just goes in a exactly. circle. Um, yeah, it's, it's, really, a, it's, it's like terrible. the Simpsons monorail. It's a terrible failure, and it you know it takes up space and it creates dead zones, and nobody uses it, and it's just very costly. So you know, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Um, so sometimes you know, sometimes cities decline. I mean, the main indicator of a declining city is loss of population. You know, New Orleans is another example of that. Um, so you, know, you have to sometimes cities cities don't cities like Detroit don't disappear entirely. There have been, you know, if you look at the history of cities from like 1500 to today, very few cities have actually disappeared from the yeah. I mean, I'm talking about, we're talking about in the dozens, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, in the last 500, 600 years. Uh, they just, you know, they, they die, or so they're, they're, they're close, and then they come back, right? It's a great opportunity. And Maybe that's what Detroit is. It's, it's for somebody. It's a great opportunity for somebody. All this 
empty space is some place they can they can camp out and start a little village. Maybe they should have like Burning Man. Burning Man <laughs> should take place in Detroit. I'm not that kidding. Maybe a, a I mean, dangerous proposition in Detroit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, just you know, promote. Um, maybe the city could promote something like that, or promote. Yeah. I was just in Austin, Texas, where they had uh, this motorcycle rally, the Republic of Texas. You know, I could have like the Republic of uh, Michigan, or, you know, some yeah. kind of rally thing. Bring in, and you have all the space, you could use it for something or another, and, and some bright person will see an opportunity, put two and two together. And, but then you have to allow that to happen. Yeah. Right? I, w I will say there I, are I some know. cool art projects in Detroit. Um, there's a neighborhood that's been made into one big art project called the Heidelberg Project. It's a little weird, um, but it's cool, I guess, that it's there. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's and it's just. Thing. I think that you're right. Like, let things happen. Let people take advantage of opportunities. I hope, I hope that's what we see. I get a little misty-eyed when I think about Detroit because it's sort of home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's hard well, to no, grow up I, looking across. I, 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 I don't place. mean to sound cold or anything like that, but you know, sometimes there's some neighborhoods that you know can't be saved right away. I mean, that yeah. you have to let them go so that some other parts can do better. I mean. I think Detroit will come back. It's just... I hope so. Yeah. Um, I think so I have one more poll that I'm going to launch, and I've got a question that I think uh, you'll find interesting. Oh, this poll, by the way, you can answer. Every, if you think every single option is right, you can pick every single one. Um, but just kind of a, a quick question. Uh, do you think there's an ideal size for a city that balances good and bad? That's from William. He asked it pretty early on, um, but I thought I would yeah. tackle it right away. No, I don't. Um, I don't. Uh, cities are one of, you know, they say that, um, um, you know, Nassim Taleb, the, the, the black swan guy, is yep. a mathematician who wrote about uh, uh, many things. But uh, I, I asked him, well, he, he came to a colloquium once and, and, and he was talking about uh, uh, sea creatures. He said, like, like whales, uh, they can grow to, they're almost unlimited in size because the, the, the buoyancy of the ocean. And remember, as long as they live, they'll just keep on growing. That's why that's why very old whales are just are so huge. Octopuses too, right? They, they just grew. But, and so in other words, they're scale free, uh, and cities are like that. Cities are scale free. Uh, you, you can have a, you know, the largest city um, in the world in 1800. Uh, you know, what London uh, had a million people. Uh, now the largest urbanized area in the world, probably Tokyo, Tokyo Yokohama. You know, close to 20 million people. Um, I, there's no upper limit to to what a, a city can be, as as long as you know the conditions that enable the kinds of things we're talking about: um, economic development, spontaneous order, uh, emergent uh, social networks, and that sort of thing to, to make people safe and secure, give different neighborhoods, different districts, an identity that they can um, uh, live, uh, promote, and live with. I mean, there's no there's no limit to the, to to the up to the maximum size. There's no maximum size of the city. Yeah, and that's kind of cool for those of us who love cities. I I I think that's just neat for reasons that I can't articulate. I wanted to share very quickly the results of the yeah, poll. Um, I tried to think of a few things that uh, might help, and as you can see, everybody thinks decentralizing decision making to districts and neighborhoods. Um, might be a good idea to help utilize that local local knowledge or local knowledge, which is a, what I was about yeah. to say. Um, and Let's then some people don't like zoning. Um, some people think that uh, better city plans might have a role to play. And I mean, I guess we don't know. the the great um, The great thing about cities is that they are places for experimentation. Um, so right. hopefully, we get to see a lot of these things tried out. And for sure, we've got a oh, go ahead. It's just not only economic experimentation, but somebody had community organizations. Yeah. I mean, that kind of experimentation too, local governance, you know, that, it's an amazing possibility there. Yeah. Uh, oh, I could talk about it for another hour, um, but I won't do that to everybody. <laughs> um, well, let's unfortunately, do we've got a little bit over time. Uh, there were a few other things we wanted to talk about. I'm going to try and make the resources available online. One of them is uh, Sandy has this great talk called A City Cannot Be a Work of Art which is a really intriguing statement, I think. So I'll see if I can make something like that available through the website. Um, and the website, of course, is fee.org slash big ideas. I, I, it's a, on all of our graphics, so hopefully you've seen it by now. Um, Sandy has a column with the Freeman, which is uh, Fee's magazine, and it's called Wabi Sabi, which is, oh, remind me what it means. 
Um, the idea, it's a, it's a Zen Buddhist term that one, one interpretation is that you see the beauty in imperfection, in impermanence, um, and that sort of thing. And I, so I want to recommend it. It's uh, maybe my favorite column, uh, par only partly because he writes often about cities and that I'm really enthusiastic oh, about them much. right now. Um, I will be sharing a few uh, columns from that. Uh, like us on Facebook so that you can keep up with us. Uh, we're going to make this video available, so if you know anyone who wanted to attend but couldn't, I know there's a World Cup match tonight and that the USA is playing. I'm sorry. There's just a lot of oh things going on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, so if you know anybody who, who maybe had natural loyalties that, that couldn't be broken to join us tonight, um, follow us on Facebook. I share a lot of articles I and I will share the videos as well. And join us again. Um, my next event will be with, uh, he's not on here, but Don Boudreau from George Mason University. And the name of the event is, uh, what does it cost to keep them out? So we're going to be talking about Excellent. trade restrictions and immigration restrictions and why they don't always work out exactly the way that we think that they might. Um, but I yeah, really want to thank Don Sandy for being on. Yeah, so much we can talk about there too. <laughs> I want to thank Sandy so much for being on tonight. Like I said, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I think it's been really great. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us as well. Yes, thank you, everybody. My pleasure. Janet, take care. You too. Bye, everyone.